boat approaches the island. A feeling of isolation from the world. Yet somehow I am overwhelmed by a sense that my arrival is expected. The jetty dotted with figures. My eyes focus on a man. Tall, dark, compelling. The realization. I am no longer alone. The island house of the man from the jetty. A clutter of pictures, large canvases, scraps of paper, oils, watercolors, sketches in chalk and charcoal, doodles in pencil and ink. You are an artist. Their ideas. Expressed through making marks on paper or canvas, a way of holding back some fleeting line, rhythm, mood, or shape from the brink of oblivion. You are interested in art. This castle, ivy-clad towers and turrets. This portrait of a raven-haired girl, and this youth. With eyes the color of violets, the color of my eyes. Yes, yes, I noticed. I have been on a long journey, but now I have arrived. It's as if my past, my future, my whole being and reason are here, in this place. Your coming may make sense of all these lines and marks and daubs of paint. Will you tell me your story? It would have to begin with this painting. That miniature, a cluttered bedroom, filled with flickering light and dancing shadows, guttering candles and fluttering birds. Well, uh, your ladyship, the doctor's verdict. <laughs> the child, you mean? Yes, Prince Collar. What is it? Oh. Uh, uh, a boy, uh, your ladyship. Uh, unquestionably, uh, a boy, a boy, an heir to the house of Groan. A boy. Oh yes, Lady Gertrude. Most decidedly. Then call him Titus. The history of Titus Groan by Mervyn Peake. Dramatized by Brian Sibley, with Luke Treadaway as Titus and David Warner as the artist. Titus arrives. The moment of my birth. It is as if, deep in Gormenghast's fist of ancient stone, a doll's hand wriggles, warm, rebellious on a frozen palm. In the painting. A series of feathery daubs. In the room, a row of birds along a bed rail. A raven and a magpie, a stone chat, a missel thrush, two starlings, and a small owl. And what have I omitted? Suddenly, at the ivy-filled window, a rook. Yes, a white rook. Where have you been, Master Chalk? You wicked bunch of feathered whiteness! My mother, Lady Gertrude, seventy-sixth Countess of Groan. What trees has he been sitting in? This is how I painted her: vast and remote, propped up in her bed with thick, lustrous coils of dark red hair, clustered upon the pillows like burning snakes. Very well, my whitest one, come here with your old beak and rub it on my arm. Come along. <laughs> What? <laughs> uh, forgive me, your ladyship. A, a, a thousand pardons. <laughs> indeed, indeed, a hundred thousand. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the very least. Doctor Prune Squalor, dear Doctor Prune, physician to the House of Groan. Well, what are you waiting for? Um, a quick sketch. Hair, a grey hayrick. Teeth, a graveyard of tombstones, glasses magnifying his eyes like a pair of jellyfish seen through a fathom of water. His young lordship, my lady, your child. Do you do you not wish to um to um? Let Nanny Slag take care of him. I would like to see the boy when he is six. Six? 
<laughs> um, Most unusual. <clears throat> Most unique. Here, take this gold ring of mine. Fix a chain to it. Let him wear it round his wry little neck. Now leave me. Having arrived, my arrival must be announced. Yes, Flay, my good man. Mr. Flay, first servant to my father, Lord Grone of Gormongast. What news, Doctor? The child is born. A boy? Yes, a boy. <laughs> Titus the 77th. Good. Uh, yes, 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 indeed, Mr. Flay. Tell his lordship and have the news proclaimed. <laughs> An authentic male groan. Flay. Clad in faded, threadbare black, sharp, angular, parched and brittle like a shard of fallen masonry, knee joints cracking like splintering stones. Titus the 77th. Good. Challenge to change? No change. A groan is born. Countess Gertrude's given birth. A new groan. A child of the stone. Titus, they've called him. Titus, the future of Gormenghast. Titus, the 77th. Heir to Sepulchrave, the 76th. So the news spreads throughout Gormenghast. Immemorial stones. Piled up into great walls, lofty battlements, time-eaten buttresses. Mile upon rambling mile of courtyards, corridors, stairwells. Oh, what day is it? My father, Sepulchrave the 76th, the iron crown of the groans upon his head, sits in the stone hall. I asked what day it is, Sir Dust. It is the sixth day of the month, your lordship. Ah, oh, the sixth. Always a heavy day. The sixth. Proceed. <coughs> I, Sourdust, Lord of the Library, nonagenarian and student of the grown lore. Sourdust, ancient lord of ritual, ragged crimson sacking hanging on his fragile limbs, his face a mass of lines, his black and white beard a tangle of knots. Seven hundred and thirty seven. Such half moon to be thus scorned into the Have earth. you heard, Sourdust? Lordship? Have you heard about my son? Now I am alone. My sister, Fuchsia. Quite alone. In her secret attic kingdom. When I am Countess and the rest are dead, I shall burn down Gormenghast and live on my own. Till then, this is where I can do just what I like. Fuchsia is a study in red and black. Her flame red dress, her jet black hair flapping down her back like a pirate's flag. Her eyes smolder. Only I know. Only I know the way here. Up the stairs and into the lumber room. Up the ladder and into my secret attic, through the door and out onto the veranda. Oh! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven! Seven of them! Seven fat little clouds! Why seven? One for a glorious golden grave, two for a terrible torch of tin, three for a hundred hollow horses, four for a knight with a spare of spear grass, five... Five for... Five for a fish with fortunate fins. Six for... What are they doing down there? Kitchen servants swarming around like a lot of ants. Something's happened. Something no one's told me. Well, I'll make them tell me. I'll make them. Mr. Flay follows the news of my birth down to the subterranean depths of the great kitchen of Gormenghast. A steaming, airless concentration of ghastly heat. Everything confusion. Tables overturned, floor littered with stockpots, basting pans, broken dishes and oddments of food. Disgusting vulgarity. <laughs> but only right and fitting to celebrate the birth of a new groan. Silence! Yeah, tell me this. 
my stenching cherubs. Who am I? Swelter. Abiatha Swelter. <laughs> Chief Chef of Gormengast. A great expanse of warm, vague whiteness is balancing with difficulty upon a cask of wine. His tall chef's hat rises coldly like the topsail of a ghostly galley. Before him, a sea of pale faces, the kitchen apprentices, in their striped and sodden jackets and small white caps. Now, my ghastly little ineffectual fillets, listen most attentive some. Here, pass me another ball. Come closer. Oh, the creamy little faces. <laughs> oh, is this in our midst? Oh, my giblets, if it isn't Mr. Flea. To what do we owe this dubious honour? First servant of Gormengast has freedom of castle. Oh, <laughs> then, my ducklings, we must all be very respectful in front of the very important <laughs> and excruciatingly cadaverous Mr. Flea. <laughs> ha! Come closer in, my belching angels. Where is he? He's not amongst the apprentices where he should be. But he must be somewhere in this sea. Over there? In the shadow of the pillar? That high-shouldered boy with dark, half-closed eyes, hot with hatred? Could it be? Where is... Steerpike? Yes. That's him. Where is... Steerpike! He's here somewhere, sir! There he is! There he is! Steerpike! Yes, sir. I shall sing to you, my core of curdled cat pile. <laughs> Why him? Why to you, eh? My ray of adult sunshine. Why to you alone? I cannot imagine, sir. Because, my dear little steer pikey, you... You, a creature of less consequence than Stort's blood, <laughs> move here and there on your measly little legs. We all have to walk, sir. I've seen you look at me. You're looking at me now! Sing the song, sir. The song, sir. The song, sir. Oh, there's the song. A freckled and frivolous kick <laughs> there was that sailed on a pointless sea. Or oh, any lugubrious leg there was in a man emphatic and <laughs> Eyes, bloodshot bubbles. Face, glistening like jelly. The chef lurches in his anchorage. The great ship's canvas sags and crumples. The enormousness founders and sinks in a cataleptic mass of wine-drenched blubber. Oh, steer pike. Swelter. Enough. He moves like an insect. Where's he going? No way out of the kitchen through there. A secret panel. At last, my chance. A way out. Escape. Go, quick. A maze of passageways, twisting, turning in the dark. Oh, I must keep up. I mustn't let him out of my sight. The dusty drafty passageway in the west wing, high above the great kitchen. An unexpected encounter. Oh, well, oh, well, well, well. Oh. Ha, 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 ha. If it isn't dear Mrs. Slag. Oh, my poor Wigger, what a start you gave me. My dear old nanny. Oh. In the absence of my mother, all I ever knew of motherly affection. How very, very dramatic. <laughs> but fortuitous to the one person I have been seeking. Me, sir? Why, sir, what have I done? Nothing, my dear lady. In fact, I was wondering what you have been doing. Why have I not seen you? Why have my ears not heard your footfall on the stairs, your voice at nightfall calling? Oh, Lady Gertrude don't want me no more, sir. Haven't seen her for months and months. Then you will have no idea why I'm looking for you now. None, sir. Tell me, Mrs. Slag, what are you? Uh, um, I'm an old woman, sir. Do you like babies? Baby, sir. Yes. Are you fond of the little creatures taken by and large? 
Whoa, I could eat the darlings, sir. I could eat them up. Oh, quite, quite so, my good woman. But uh, that would be unnecessary. In fact, it would be positively injurious in the circumstances about which I must enlighten you. A child will be placed in your keeping. A child? Do not devour him, Nanny Slag. It is for you to bring him up, that is true, but there will be no need for you to swallow him first. <laughs> you would be <laughs> swallowing a groan. <gasps> no. Oh, no, sir. Yes, so, yes, sir. <gasps> I have today delivered the Countess of a child. Oh, sir. After all this time. You must fetch a wet nurse for the child from the outer dwelling. Oh, I will, sir. Oh, another baby. I could smack him already. <laughs> him? <laughs> you are very sure of these sex. Oh, yes, sir. It's an him, sir. Oh, what a blessing that is. What of the newborn's sister, Mrs Slag? You think Fuchsia is also unaware of this news? Oh, yes, sir. If she'd known, she'd have told her old nanny, bless her. She don't know nothing. Huh. This darkness. I can't see her head. I can't keep up with him. I'll, I'll get locked in. I'll never find my way out. Wait! What? What's that? Please! Wait! Who's this? One of Swelter's little kitchen rats, eh? What are you doing here? Don't want Swelter's boys here. Curse them! I don't want to be here. Give me daylight and I'll go away. Where? Far away. Anywhere. Anywhere from that dreadful Mr. Swelter. He sang to you. What's your name? Queer Pike. Steer Pike, sir. How old? Seventeen, sir. I want to leave that vile swelter. Did you see him? He fell like a log. Quite right. Doing honours. What have you done? Done, sir. What happiness? I haven't any happiness. What? Rebellion, is it? No. No. Except... Against Mr. Swelter. Swelter? Swelter? Always Swelter? Don't talk of that name. Leave it in its fat and grease. Here, take this candle. Lead the way. Uh, which way? Straight on. Now left. Keep to the left. I'll teach you to be unhappy. Right. When a groan is born. A groan is born? Born, yes. Straight on. Show you what it means. A male groan. Keep on! Yes. Turn right. Then lift. A new body under the old stones. And through the arch. One of Swelter's, too. Don't like him, eh, Steer Pike? No, sir, I don't. Wait here. Come. Our way through here. Cat room. Cat room. Inside. Cats. Hundreds of white cats. Come on. The blizzard of snow white fur on a cobalt carpet, like a field of blue pasture. They sit in a hundred decorative attitudes or stand immobile like carvings or walk across the sapphire setting into weaving with one another in a living arabesque. Uh, through here and up the stairs. Whose cats were those, sir? Cats? The white cats. Who do they belong to? My lady's white cats, they are. All hers. Are we close to where she lives? Silence! Silence! Hold your tongue, you greasy fork. Talk too much. In here. Another room. Octagonal, hung with full-length portraits of forgotten groans in huge, dusty gold frames. Pushing a painting a little to one side, Flay reveals a spy hole to which he applies his eye and sees what he expected to see. A corridor with three doors. The central one, the door to my mother's room. Stained black and decorated with an enormous painted white cat. Yeah. Look. Cat doors hers. 
Deer Pike, already master of the seized opportunity, spies on the corridor, seeing and hearing what he ought not to see and hear. What's this? Oh, doctor, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> the new father, <laughs> the birth, prune squalor. I see. Satisfactory. I am exceptionally gratified, Lord Sepulgrave. Exceptionally. Indeed I am. <laughs> Did you notice anything, um, anything strange? Anything unusual about him? Hmm? Unusual? I'm not... Anything wrong with him? Structurally, a, a sound child. Sound as a, as a bell. Tinkle, tinkle. Structurally. <laughs> his face. Didn't you see his face? I noticed uh, his face, sir. Oh, yes, I, 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 I definitely noticed it. And did you or did you not think it was strange? I, I, I should say the face was irregular. You mean ugly? It's uh, unnatural. What's the difference, man? Why must you hedge? Is the boy hideous? Have you ever delivered a more hideous child? Be honest. Never. Never. <laughs> never. And then, never a boy with such, such extraordinary eyes. Eyes? And what is the matter with my son's eyes? I, I was referring to the colour, my lord. They're, they're violet. Who's she? It's not true. It's not true. I won't believe it. Are you sure? Come here. Oh. Yes, father. And what has upset you, daughter? Oh, I just heard silly rumours. They say I've got a brother. Idiots! I hate them. I haven't, have I? <sighs> have I? Little brother, yes. <laughs> a minute, infinitesimal, microscopic addition to the famous line of groan. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, indeed. Very much so. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> it's not. Fusha. Oh, how I hate, hate. Back! That's enough, Swelter's boy. You've seen her door. Back! Not back to that loathsome Chevron, no, please. I couldn't. Too busy to have you here. Too busy. Can't He's wait. ugly! Who? Uh, he's hideous. Who's hideous, you kitchen thing? Who? The baby! The new baby! What are these lies all about? Lord Drone said so. The doctor said so. They both said so. Most terrible ears. I'll tear your little ears off, you <laughs> sneaky thing. Come here! If I go back to Swelter, I'll tell him and all of them what I heard his lordship say. Come here! Or I'll break your bones. I've been a gaping, have you? I'll fix you. Let me go, let me go, or I'll tell everyone what I know. <laughs> You will not tell anyone anything. Oh. oh. Oh, my poor old heart. Such a long way. The outer dwellings on the evening of my birth. Mad hovels swarming like an epidemic around the outer walls of Gormenghast clamping themselves to it like limpets to a rock. Find the little mite a wet nurse. The homes of the bright carvers, who labour for a year making wild and exotic carvings. Emerald horses, gilded dryads, piebald sharks. One of which will be chosen by the Lord of Gormenghast and added to the Hall of Bright Carvings, while the rest are burned to ashes. One from the castle comes amongst us. Oh, but I must remember the correct words. Nanny Slag. The bright carvers. Fourteen inches taller on account of a black hat, topped off with a brittle bunch of glass grapes that flare in the moonlight. I have come to you, the bright carvers, to tell you a wonderful thing. A new little groan has been born. A little boy of the blood, Titus the 77th. I am Mrs. Slag. The child's nanny, and I'm in charge. I want a wet nurse for him. I must have one at once to come back with me. I will come with you. Oh, you will. I had a child. He died only hours after being born. They buried him yesterday. Were you strong enough? 
I am. And I am ready. Well, if you are sure, my dear. Yes. Shall we go? Your name? Kida. And how old are you, Kida, dear? Twenty. You said you lost a baby of your own. But what about your family? This is for the best. Well, I do hope so. Come and see his young lordship. There he is. There I am. My infant self. Oh, there's my little sugar. And I've brought someone to see you, haven't I? Yeah. Oh, look at his little pippin of a face. The puckered up face. Old as the world, wise as the roots of trees. <laughs> Look at him, Kida. Oh. What does she see in my ugly little face? Earth's passions, oh. Earth's griefs, Earth's incongruous, ridiculous humours. Oh. Oh. Do you think I shouldn't have left him? He's hungry. Give him to me. So many years ago, I cannot picture her face, yet I can still taste the milk of her frustrated love. Morning. Steer Pike is pacing the octagonal room of portraits, a prisoner. He has, with the ruthless tenacity of the born survivor, a single obsession. Escape. A sketch of Steerpike. Her face as pale as clay. If it were not for his eyes, it could be a mask. <sighs> no one. <sighs> I must escape. Somehow. Those eyes, set close together, are small, dark red, and of a startling concentration. Only other way out. The window. Oh. oh, precipitous drop. Oh, it's too far to jump. No, up. <clears throat> no, there's no way up. Unless <clears throat> old creeper hanging from the gutter. But how to reach it? <clears throat> Fifteen. More like 20 feet of unscalable stone. <sighs> it's impossible! <sighs> Except... <clears throat> a few jutting stones. Maybe a crevice. A toehold? Perhaps. <sighs> right. The choices. Wait for the thin man's return, as he will, sooner or later. Then he'll try and make me go back to Swelter's kitchen. But I won't. I won't. No, never! So... Have to climb. Today is the seventh day of the seventh month and the christening of Titus the 77th. Here to Gormand What are you wrong with those flowers? Where have they got to go? The christening room, of course. Oh, I've got the linen. Who's bringing the christening bowl? I am. Well, don't slop it and hurry up. I'm coming. You mustn't keep them waiting. A room, cool, clear and unperturbed, waits with space and dignity, filled with flowers, gold, white and lavender, and overlooking cedar-dotted lawns like emerald glass. Enter a scarecrow, gaunt Mr. Flay, in his long black moth eaten suit wearing a heavy chain of brass. Oh, this room never feels like part of Gormenghast. Too much light, too much colour, flowers. Ooh, back there. Watch your feet, my little rat's eyes. Stand still or I'll fill it yet. Well, well, well. May I be boiled to a frazzle if it isn't Mr. Flea? <laughs> yeah, before me. 
dive through the keyhole, I do believe. <laughs> oh, my adorable lights and liver. Here, advance me, little fairy boys. Be recognised. Allow me to introduce you. My dear little creatures, this extraordinarily thin gentleman is Mr Flea. Mr Flea, Master Springers, Master Springers, Mr Flea. Mr Flea, Master Rattle. How dare you! Dare you introduce me, first servant of Gormenghast, to your ten-a-penny kitchen boys? Out of my way! Oh, 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 oh. best me, but I've offended Mr. Flea. You insult the first servant of the House of Groan, and this, my ancient chain of office, you monstrous mountain of lies! <laughs> <laughs> mm. On Swelter's great ocean of soft cheek, a hectic line of red, pulpy marks. First blood. You will discover, Mr. Flea, that was a gross miscalculation. <sighs> Don't look down. Up. Must look up. Now. Reach! Oh, find it. Find that crevice. Right! Now the other hand. Where is it? Where? It feels like the wall's swaying. I feel sick. There. Now, up. The hour of my christening is now at hand. Ah, am I the first? With the exception, of course, of the ever loyal, mm. ever present Mr. Flay. Ah, Lady mm. Paris and Lady Cora, mm. here to see your nephew christened? Why shouldn't we be? We're Sepulchre's sisters. His twin sisters. We've a right. A caricature. Dressed alike in purple with gold buckles at their throats, their faces identical to the point of indecency, but quite expressionless. Preliminary layouts for faces. What are you doing here? Your ladyships, can it be that you are ignorant of the part I play in the social life of Gormenghast? Yes, yes. This ceremony today, my very dear ladyships, is a result of my professional adroitness on the occasion of a brand new groan. What did you say? Your ladyship, you must listen. You, you will never get on in life unless you listen. Get on in life? I like that. What chance have we when Gertrude has what we ought to have? Yes, we ought to have what she has. And what is that? Power. Power. Power! Power. Power. <coughs> Fingers dead. No! Go no. on. No. Oh. What's that? Oh, 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 the creeper! Oh, oh, right here. Within my grasp. Will it hold me? Yes. Now, click, climb. Climb! Ah, must reach ah, the gutter! Ah. Draw near to greet the one who must soon draw nigh to receive his name. Why is it all taking so long? Now, now, be quiet, Mrs. Slag. It will be over soon. Oh, be quiet indeed. I've never heard of such ignorance. If only you knew what it means to be in such a position of honour. When the precious thing's so quiet and good and ready to cry at any minute. Oh, my poor heart, why doesn't his lordship call for me? Now. Up onto the slate. Oh. Ah, there. At last. Oh. Oh, I'm free. Oh. 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 Oh.
gathered. Save only him for whom this gathering is gathered. The child's father in his crown and robes, the mother with a grey bird perched upon her shoulder, the purple-clad aunts, the sister in a white dress, her eyes red from crying. All I hear, save only he for whom we are all here. The doctor, his perfect hands are fluttering, flay, a statue of chiselled wood, swelter, ruined face disguised with flour and white honey and sour dust. These have their voices that he shall hear when his ear is tuned to Gormenghast, whose voice is endlessness of endlessness. How much more is that? <clears throat> the word is complete, your ladyship. What happens now? Do you remember, Cora, from when Fuchsia was christened? We were there. I remember that. Where have you been since then? Uh, we've been in the South Wing all the time, Gertrude. Yes, that's where we've been. Doing what? Thinking. Thinking. That's what we've been doing. Thinking a lot. <clears throat> Lord Sepulcrave, as the 76th Earl of Grone, will now call for his son. Oh. My son. A vista, a small figure, clad in kitchen rags, sitting astride the spine of one of the roofs of Gormengast, surveys the mist of masonry, parapet, turret and cornice, spreading to the right and left and away from him, as far as the eye can see. Oh, a heron, alone, up here, <laughs> like me. A swarm of crows. A wall covered with something emerald green and moving. <gasps> Lizards. A tower with a stone basin of rainwater and something swimming. A white horse. But no way back into the castle. <sighs> So many windows and so many walls and towers, but no way up or in. Unless that attic window high up on that ivy-covered wall. Yes. It might be done if my luck and strength hold out. My son. Louder, Sepulchre. Hmm? Call louder. My son. Oh, my poor weak heart. The uh, welcome, my lord. Uh, Inheritor of the powers I hold. Continuer of the bloodstock of stones. Approach me now. I see what's happened. We're late. Aye, a mere link in the dynastic chain. I adjure you to advance as a white bird on iron skies through walls of solemn cloud. Approach now that named and fated you shall be consecrate in Gormengast. Child, welcome. Here we are. This is the great book of baptism. It is written that between these pages where the flax is grey with wisdom, the first-born male child of the house of Groan shall be lowered and laid lengthways. Lengthways, woman. And that the pages that are heavy with words shall be bent in and over him so that he is engulfed in the seer text, encircled with the profound safety pen, pen squalor. Yes, safety pen. Yes. And is as one with the inviolable law. The iron sacrament being fixed with the steel pen. Thus, we will approach the baptismal bowl. Look, oh, it's on He's slipping. Oh, you. Baby! 
My son. My precious. My book. They're not. They resemble rubber. Just a core of India rubber with an elastic centre. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Very much so. What? Uh, resilience uh, is not the word for it, my lady. <laughs> oh, dear me, no, no. Every ounce of bounce. <laughs> what are you talking about, squalor? Uh, I was referring to a child who has just fallen to earth. Earth, that is, with a veneer or two of stone, wood and carpet in between its barbaric self and his minute lordship. <laughs> Whom you can no doubt hear screaming. So that's what it is. Oh, my poor little puppy. There they Nanny's My first recorded hey. act of blasphemy. Oh, he has oh. violated the book of baptism. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Steer Pike the Climber scrambles and clambers ever higher through the dusty, matted mass of ivy, ever nearer to my world. <laughs> no end to this terror. He is now weary beyond weariness. I can't see for sweat. Hammers in my head. Hammers in my chest. How does he find the strength to go on? Ah, the pain! Ah. I must be nearly there. Ah. The stone ledge. At last. A windowsill. Yes! Ah. 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 Fuchsia's attic. Steerpike has arrived. I hate all things. Every single tiniest thing. I hate the world! I shall live alone. Always alone. Then someone will come. Someone from another kind of world. A new world. Not from this world. But someone who is different. And he will fall in love with me at once because I live alone and aren't like the other beastly things in this world. And he'll enjoy having me because of my pride. Where am I? What's happened? Someone's coming. He will be tall. Taller than Mr. Flay. And strong like a lion. And with yellow hair like a lion's. Only more curly. Trapped. Use your brains. Think. Play dead. He will be cleverer than Dr. Prune, and he'll wear a long black cape so that my clothes will look brighter still. And he will say, Lady Fuchsia? And I shall say, What is it? It's her, Lady Fuchsia. You must remember, I am Fuchsia. I must always be. I am me. I am... A body. A boy! <laughs> well... Where... Where am I? What do you want? Where... Oh... Oh, your ladyship. Go away. This is my room. My room. I hate you for coming here. Lady Fuchsia Groan, I beg your forgiveness. Who are you? My name is Steerpike, my lady. What do you want? I come for sanctuary. I'm here because I've escaped and there was nowhere else to go. You've got kitchen clothes on. Uh, yes. It's the kitchen I escaped from. I detested it. I want to be free. I shall never go back. So you're an adventurer? That is just what I am. I am a rebel. I'm at your service as a dreamer and as a man of action. But just now, I beg you, give me a little time to rest, and then I will go far away, and I will never come again. Unless... What? You could introduce me to someone who may employ me. All I want is one interview. My brains will do the rest. How did you get here? I climbed. You must be a good climber. <laughs> I am. And I've seen so many wonderful things on my journey from the kitchen to your room. What things? A uh, great pavement of grey stones among the clouds. Bigger than a meadow, where no one goes, only a heron. And I saw a wall of basking lizards. And a horse swimming in the top of a tower. I saw a million towers today, and now... 
Now, I'm here where you hate me being. An adventure with nowhere else to go. No one is allowed to come here. So hurry up and go away. But you promised to introduce me to someone who might employ me. I didn't. How dare you tell such lies. But you could. Couldn't you? I don't know. Oh, very well then. I'll take you to Dr. Prune. He'll know what to do. Well, 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 well. So, who is this friend of yours with the fiery eyes, my dear little ladyship? His name is Steerpike. At your service, sir. He's come because he wants to work because he's clever, so I brought him. Indeed. I have always been fascinated by those who want to work. <laughs> Most absorbing and uncanny. Now, fuchsia, my dear. Uh, a little refreshment, a little stimulant, perhaps? What do you think? Mm, I don't know. But I do, my dear child. Glass of elderberry wine is precisely what the doctor ordered. And uh, what will you have, Master Steer Pike? And what in the name of hosiery are you wearing? I'm wearing what I'm forced to wear, until clothes can be found which are more appropriate. Sir, you asked me what I would take. Brandy. I thank you, sir. Brandy. Ha-ha! <laughs> Brandy it shall be. <laughs> Am I mistaken, or are those kitchen clothes? These rags, although in official uniform, are as absurd upon me as they are insulting. Everything is kitchen about me, sir, except myself. I must say, they look amazingly unhygienic. <laughs> Even for Swelter's kitchen. <laughs> so what are you? Are you a problem case, my dear boy, or are you a clear-cut young gentleman with no ideas at all? <laughs> with your permission, Doctor, I am neither. I have plenty of ideas, though, at the moment, plenty of problems, too. Is that so? Mm. How very unique. <laughs> have your brandy, and perhaps some of them will fade gently away upon the fumes of that very excellent narcotic. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <sighs> my problems are varied. The most immediate is to impress you with my potentialities. To be able to make such an unorthodox remark is in itself a sign of some originality. <laughs> I am not indispensable to you at the moment, sir, because you never made use of my services. But after a week's employment under your roof, sir, I could become so. I would be invaluable. I am purposely precipitous in my remarks. Either you reject me here and now, or... Or what? Master Steerbike of the many problems. Or you already have at the back of your mind a desire to know me further. I am 17, sir. Do I sound like 17? Do I act like 17? I am clever enough to know that I am clever. <laughs> he is clever, Dr Prune. Is he now? I merely wish to impress you with my talent, which I am ready and able to put at your service in any and every form. And if you will allow my presumption, I will raise my glass to you, sir. <laughs> well, 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 well. <laughs> By all that's intriguing, this is really this. this is, uh, the quintessential... <laughs> what madness! <laughs> By all that's impudent! <laughs> oh, what a very rare frenzy indeed! Oh, oh, oh. Well, prodigy, my dear boy, you have done me a lot of good. My lungs have needed something like that for a long time. Then I've done something for you already, sir. Possibly, Master Steerbike. You do certainly interest me. <laughs> Or rather, you tantalise me in a pleasant sort of way. Thank you, sir. But whether I want you hanging around my house is, as you, with your enormous brain, will readily admit, quite a different kettle of fish. I don't hang about, sir. It's one of the things I never do. I have to go now, Dr Prune. I'm very tired. Of course. Let me see you to the door. Then I will return to further cogitate the fate of Master Steerpike. Come, come, my dear. My dear Fuchsia, you are angry and, and sad and unhappy. Your baby brother has hurt you. I understand how, how difficult... I sometimes want to go far away from here, to another kind of land where people who didn't know that I was the Lady Fuchsia would be surprised when I told them that I was, and they would treat me better and be more polite and do some homage sometimes. I know, my child. I know. Good night, Dr Broom. Yes, good night. Good night, my dear, and take care... What are we to do with you, my 
diabolically clever little monster. That is what I hoped you would realise, Doctor. <laughs> but haven't all ambitious people something of the monstrous about them? You, sir, for instance, if you'll forgive me, are a little bit monstrous. My poor youth, there is not the minutest molecule of ambition in my anatomy. Monstrous, uh, though it may appear to you. <laughs> I do not mean ambition for success. No, success is a meaningless word. The successful, so I hear, are very often failures in their own eyes. No, I refer to an ambition to cultivate and perfect taste, which as I can see from the contents of this room, your calf-bound books, your glassware, your violin, <laughs> you've already clearly done. You interest me. <laughs> Who is this? A lady whose striking similarity to Dr. Prune's squalor is unmistakable. Who is this, Alfred? I said, who is this? Long-necked and rigid, her angular body tightly swathed in a black dress... She wears a pair of darkly tinted glasses perched on her sharp nose. Alfred, I'm speaking to you. Can you hear me? Can you? Can you? Very distinctly, Irma, my dear. Your voice is ringing in my middle ear. <laughs> in fact, it's ringing in both of them. <laughs> this bone of my bone is Master Steerpike, who was brought to see me on account of his talents. He is very anxious for me to make use of his brain. Not as you might suppose, as a floating specimen in one of my jam jars. <laughs> but, uh, but in its capacity as a vortex of dazzling thought. Steer Pike. This, Master Steer Pike, is my sister, Miss Irma Prunesquala. I'm at your service, madam. What are you wearing, boy? It's with regret that at my introduction to you I should be in clothes that so belie my fastidious nature. Standing beside you, madam, in your exquisite gown of darkness. <gasps> gown of darkness is good. Gown of darkness, a phrase. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a phrase. You have broken into our conversation, Alfred, haven't you? Yeah. Haven't you? I'll have a suit cut for you tomorrow, Steerpike. You will be here, I suppose. Where are you sleeping? Is he sleeping here? Where do you live? Where does he live, Alfred? What have you arranged? Well, nothing. I expect. Have you done anything? Have you? Have you? What sort of thing, Irma, my dear? I've done all sorts of things. Removed a gallstone the size of a potato. Oh. Played upon my violin while a rainbow shone through the dispensary window. As usual, I you upon... are drunk with your own flippancy. You have a brain, Alfred. I have never denied it, never. But it is undermined by your insufferable levity. Steerpike, you wish to be employed. Is that it? Is that it? It is my ardent desire to be in your service. Why? Tell me. Why? I can only say that I feel a desire to fulfil myself by finding employment under your roof. And to, no doubt, snatch the first opportunity of getting away from Swelter and the unpleasant duties you had to perform. Is that not so? It is. Eloquent and forthright, a rare combination. Mr Steerpike will join... Our household. Don't you think so, Alfred? Yes, yes, indeed. I am, Irma, my dear. Far beyond thinking, I hand over the reins to you. Mount and be gone. The world awaits you. I'm confident I shall give satisfaction, dear lady. My reward will be to see you perhaps once more, perhaps twice more, if you'll allow me in this dark gown that so becomes you. <laughs> Come. <clears throat> Master Steerpike, I will show you to your room. There is a very fine view of the castle from this room. I uh, hope you will enjoy it, Master Steerpike. How could I not, Miss Prunesquala, since it's through your kindness that I'm able to do so? I will have you called in the morning and instruct you in your duties. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? With the greatest of pleasure, madam. <laughs> Steer Pike looks out from his window at the mountainous outline of Gormungast Castle rising darkly into the night. Somewhere on that silent, silhouetted mass of masonry is the tortuous route by which he clawed and climbed to freedom across Gormenghast's time-worn body. Now, 
he has found a toehold within the very arteries of stone through which flows her ritual lifeblood. Time to start climbing again. Deep down in his stomach, Steerpike grins. In Titus Arrives, episode one of The History of Titus Grown by Mervyn Peake, Sepulcrave was played by Paul Rees, Gertrude by Miranda Richardson, Fuchsia by Olivia Hallinan, and Cora and Clarice by Claudie Blakely and Fenella Woolgar. Steerpike was played by Carl Prekop, Dr. Prunesqualler by James Fleet, Irma Prunesqualler by Tamsin Gregg, Sourdust by James Laley, Flay by Adrian Scarborough, Swelter by Mark Benton, Nanny Slag by Jane Whittenshaw, and Kida by Susie Riddell. Titus was played by Luke Treadaway, and the artist by David Warner. Other parts were played by Jonathan Forbes, Peter Polakapu, Alan Raglan, and Alex Tregeer. The music is by Roger Goala. The history of Titus Grown is dramatized by Brian Sibley, directed by Gemma Jenkins, and produced by Jeremy Mortimer. Thank you.